is Ella Gold. I am a graphic designer, curator, editor, writer, and educator. Born and raised in Los Angeles. Had a previous career uh, working in art and arts administration. Kind of did a career switch about five years ago. Got an MFA in graphic design uh, and am now embarking on my journey as a designer and educator. I felt like graphic design felt more honest to me than art because it's a, a very explicit trade and exchange of services for goods. And we're living in this late capitalism in which we need to make money and exchange things for goods. And although art is important and meaningful in this world, I feel like the exchange factor was something we were always trying to hide, that it was a commodity as well as being something about feelings and love, etc. Um, and the fact that it was a commodity and that we were trying so hard to hide that it was a commodity felt really dishonest to me. No, uh, but just kind of the exchange of, of putting a, a, a commercial value on something that already has commercial value inherent in it as everything does in our society felt better than pretending like I wasn't uh, doing anything in, com in the commercial world at all and that I was doing something like a, a level above. It's something I have a lot of trouble with um, and I don't feel like I have a good answer for that. I think that in, I think that that is something I encountered particularly in the academy that, and, and that felt idiosyncratic to kind of going to a, a school like CalArts that was a private school um, that is so focused on kind of like the artistic value of graphic design uh, and the academic value of graphic design and it existing kind of outside of this kind of uh, commercial culture of graphic design and this it's a little bit like of a snooty thing that like we are this kind of graphic designer we are not this kind of graphic designer and as I'm embarking on my own journey as a teacher I'm trying to figure out how to imbue the students with a feeling of like they can make academic graphic design and that that is not something that is inherently better or different than making logos for brands in a in a really kind of like more banal way and that there's ways to in, inject uh, academia and thought and concept into more banal graphic design. It's a good one. Um, I think that there are many answers to that question. I grew up, my dad is a rare rock memorabilia and record dealer. So I grew up around psychedelic posters. And in high school, I, that was kind of my first love of graphic design. And wonderfully, my dad was incredibly generous and let me kind of mine his collection and put them up in my, in my high school bedroom. So I got to have like a really awesome velvet underground Andy Warhol poster growing up and a really awesome Stooges poster that was also blacklight and a velvet under, or I already said that, a uh, Rolling Stones poster that's like also a Colby poster. So I kind of grew up with these weird psychedelic rock and roll posters from the 60s and 70s. And I feel like that was my, definitely my early intro. But as I became more of a academic graphic designer later, I think, uh, Probably I would say the April Griman full body piece poster was one of the first moments where I was able to align my interests in radical feminism and graphic design and that felt really important to me and also uh, kind of engaged me on this path of CalArts academic graphic design.
Right now, I'm looking at I'm looking at a lot of like 90s postmodernism, postmodern photography in the kind of like California way and trying to figure out what is the moment we're in now and what is idiosyncratic about Los Angeles in this moment now mm -hmm. and what are the connections that can be made between that kind of 90s postmodernism that was very conceptually driven but has such a loud formal quality with kind of the loud formalism that's happening in LA right now that perhaps has less conceptual backing and trying to figure out how to like maybe integrate more conceptualism into this kind of very LA loud eclectic formalism. I mean, I feel like it's any kind of in any way you would make a differentiation between LA and New York. Um, Los Angeles work right now that I'm seeing is very colorful. It's very bright. It's very expressive. It's very dramatic. Um, it's very, no very non-minimalist. Um, all of which I think are really positive qualities and those are my favorite types of work. At the same time, I'm not seeing, save for a few select people, um, a lot of concept-driven work. And that is the part that I feel like LA is very much devoid of because it is, and, and, and that can be, like mapped onto kind of any comparison between LA and New York, as I mentioned, in as much as, you know, they say New York's more academic and LA is a little bit more wild and free, whatever that means. I think things are changing in Los Angeles and a lot uh, more kind of intellectualism is coming this way. People are taking things more seriously in a way that they weren't taking things necessarily or taking work necessarily as seriously before, and so I'm interested to see kind of the ways progresses. I was living in New York in my early 20s, and I moved there because it was the promise of ultimate radical bohemia uh, art world. It is not true. <laughs> Fake news. Um, and I was just kind of working constantly, living in a closet, partying all the time, and very unhappy, and couldn't really under like articulate what all of those pieces of the puzzle were making me so unhappy. And I just kind of uh, I came with a friend who didn't, who had never spent time in LA. Visited my parents about I'm gonna say eight years ago, and everybody was in like Highland Park renting out old dentist's office and throwing noise shows and it cost like you know thirty dollars for them to rent it out for the night and I was like what is this world where I can you know drive to the edges of a city and people were doing the most radical weird crazy shit that I'd ever seen within the bounds of, of the city that had been in my opinion, so cruel to me growing up because it felt, when I was a child, I felt, it felt very vapid and, and blonde and, uh, you know, beach, babe, whatever, nonsense. And then I went to a private high school and all of, it, that just felt very like moneyed and, and vapid in the same way. And then I came back and it was just, everything had changed. LA could be, could be radical, it could be grimy, it could be dirty, it could be weird and everybody I knew felt that they could express themselves in that way, and that felt exciting to me. Ultimately, like, things changed a lot in the <laughs> seven years since then, and a lot of people, I think, like me, came back and did that, and had a really negative effect on the city. So it's complicated. Just in terms of um, the way that basically, you know, 50% of the art community in New York picked up shop and moved and opened galleries in Boyle Heights, a community that was already thriving with its own art community uh, for decades and, you know, uplifted. All of the these gentrifiers felt like they were uplifting the community, but really they were just creating spaces for the people who had already lived there and were already having their thriving art community to not be able to go to, not have access to. Um, and so this kind of idea that LA was this uncolonized territory where you could do anything here, unfortunately became this catalyst for gentrification 
which t often tends to be the case when you see it land that is available to people at a much lower, easier rate than a place like New York. I want to make work for good. At the same time, it seems harder and harder to figure out how to make those decisions because even if you're working for a small studio making a small piece of exhibition design, you don't know who the museum is funded by. You don't know whom, who is receiving the money at the, at the top of the ladder, what Trump association is made with any, any business that you're doing. And so it's just kind of like, I'm feeling a little bit jaded at this point where I feel like the best decisions I can make are making money however I can and using that money for good. And that's kind of like the, where my politics and my practice are meeting at this moment. Uh, I feel like in the future when I'm going to have hopefully more agency within the clients I can choose, I can then make more decisions about making explicitly political work. But at this point, just kind of diverting funds feels like the best I can do. I feel like if you go, if you travel six hours north, you will have a lot of people in San Francisco saying design is going to change the world. I feel a little bit more uh, jaded about that and more nihilistic about that idea. I think that design can, can certainly have incredible impact, particularly on a more granular level when you think about, you know, type, sm small typographic decisions, changing the way people read, changing the way people read books, changing the kinds of books people read and then they get, that kind of like escalates globally. Um, for individuals to affect change politically, I think it's harder. I think that there's now, in, in 2019, there are like incredible vehicles for doing that, especially for the youths of today. Uh, so like, you know, one person makes one Instagram post and it goes viral and it does actually end up affecting change. I think that's kind of a beautiful moment. It's something I think about a lot. It's something I haven't figured out. I would ideally love to figure out a way to have, to make a large scale change on one on one. But then there's also individual change that you can make, like just having a conversation, being a teacher, being an educator, being a book designer. I think those are all really important ways of affecting change on small scales. I'm still trying to figure that out, to be honest. Um, I don't really, I'm, I am somebody who is, always wants to be doing a lot of things. So it's kind of, it, it very much comes naturally to me, but on a day to day kind of, do I have a routine for when I work on one thing and when I work on another thing, that's the thing that I'm still definitely trying to figure out. Also when there's time for fun is unclear to me. I think graphic design is fun, so that's that's my fun. But you know the, what what humans call fun, like you know going out or things like that. <laughs> I'm an obsessive reader. Um, I read murder mystery novels pretty much primarily, <laughs> and I I read one a day if I if I have time. If, when I don't have time, it takes me like a week, but that's kind of my number one fun. I like eating well, but not fancy, just well. There have, there, I think there, there have been like cycles and waves, but certainly for the past, I, I would say, I mean, I'm, not, I'm no scholar about, uh, on this, so this is all coming from just somebody who grew up here and is trying to understand the, and navigate the city. I think certainly for like the past 20 years or so, the culture in LA has been primarily the entertainment industry. There has not been uh, an art world per se, or a music scene that have been very vibrant until the past kind of five years or so in which like people with real money, galleries and musicians, and I think th this is happening in theater as well, are coming into the city and injecting a lot more financial means into 
a city that just like was not participating in the art market five years ago. Um, and that I think is really changing the way it's, it's definitely affecting the kind of like more individual and small and micro art communities that have been with, living in the city for, you know, decades, 30, 40, 50 years. Not anymore. I would say five years ago, it was significantly less expensive than New York, half the price. When I first moved here, my rent was $300 a month in like a very, very nice house. And now my rent is $1,200 a month. Different place, but still like, that's still a quite a large differential um, in a, that short of a period of time.